Welcome to the UpstreamLife.com, a podcast that celebrates business transformation. Today, I want to talk about Indian agriculture, and there's a personal reason for doing this. Around 50 years ago, my family sold all its agricultural land to come to the city. What followed was hardship and confusion for an entire generation. Being pulled away from land, my family really could not compete in the services and trading economy, where there was no price transference. Many families in India still believe that farming is at an end and it's not lucrative. And they say it's not lucrative, yet it remains the largest employer in India. Agriculture continues to be an industry that is hotly debated in, in Indian political spheres, and it controls most of the electorate. A change in the price of onions can topple governments in India. Nearly three quarters of Indian families depend on rural incomes. 70% of India's population is found in rural areas. India produces cereal crops and horticulture crops about we have uh, you know, the cultivated area of 195 million hectares, of which 63% is rain-fed and 37% is irrigated. Today's podcast is all about that opportunity at hand for Indian agriculture and how it's changing. Now there are businesses trying to make Indian agriculture work. I have with me Mark Khan, the co-founder of Omnivore VC. Omnivore has launched three funds in India in 2010 and has invested in over 33 companies. Mark, how are you? Always a pleasure to talk to you. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me here. Uh, Mark, a quick note on your past. Uh, you know, when you were growing up abroad, when you were growing up in the US, did you ever think that you would come and work in India and start a fund in India? Just wanted a backstory. Was your family in agriculture too? Uh, so so growing up in, in the US, um, I don't think I, I knew what a fund was. Um, but I was always pretty interested in, in India. Um, I, I grew up in a, in a place called Houston, Texas. Um, it is a city known for its massive Indian population, among other things. It's sort of like Queens, New York, if it had an energy industry. And um, I actually grew up adjacent to a large Indian neighborhood. So my interest in India came from a fairly young age. I was surrounded by the you know, the, the ABCDs, the children of the NRIs, um, went to high school with a bunch and uh, actually came to India for the for the first time uh, right before university. So um, my my India story uh, goes back a long ways. I I don't think I ever thought of necessarily working in India. And uh, the first time that became viable for me when was when I was in graduate school and um, actually did some projects for ITC's agribusiness division. And uh, a few years later, found myself uh, in, in late 2007, early 2008, uh, settling in Mumbai. And that was the beginning of uh, what has been a very, very long journey. Was your, was your project in Harvard and UPenn, you know, related to agriculture? At the time? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was working for the, for the agribusiness division. Okay. And what was the experience like? I mean, you've been in India long enough now. Is it... 22 years, right? I mean, how, what, what have you seen changing? Some of the, you came in as a student, did some projects, you also worked here, and then obviously you get into the fund. Uh, what are some of your early thoughts of Indian agriculture? You know, if I look at a lot of the old writings, you know, when Kenneth Galbraith came to India in the 60s, right? Uh, he, obviously, he being, uh, in, in a way, a populist kind of a person, he also talked about a planned economy and a planned economy being very good for the nation. Uh, you know, what did you see Indian agriculture as? Because it was only 10 years into liberalization at the time when you started coming into India, 10 to 15 years. How has it changed? I think I saw it as something that needed to be unleashed. I, I saw it as, as, you know, the only sector that really hadn't been fully liberalized. Um, you know, I was definitely, my, my politics have evolved a lot, but I think at the time I was more, kind of influenced by, by writers like Gurcher and Das, um, you know, who, who at the time was trying to tell the story of, of Indian liberalization and kind of potentially where things could go. And, and, you know, what I saw in, what I saw in Indian agriculture was, you know, this, uh, you know, what I saw in Indian agriculture was this sector that, that really wasn't going anywhere, but had, insane amounts of, of opportunity that had, you know, fantastic amounts of resources that had huge amounts of employment. And I guess I always believed, as I still believe, that, you know, that the future of, of India cannot be divorced from agriculture. 
right? That that fundamentally, um, the, the the path of China is is not our path. That you know that that we can't in a democratic nation with half the nation on farm. You cannot develop without bringing the rural population with you, and it always seemed to me more obvious to to really leverage the strength that the country has in its biodiversity in agriculture, in order to to meet the needs of the world, right, with respect to agricultural exports and processed foods and various value chains, rather than trying to sell a you know another disposable bic lighter. Right, um, and and so when I when I kind of imagined um, the future of, of the Indian economy, it was kind of like three three legs to the stool. Right, it was essentially value added engineering. Right, so specialty you know manufacturing, kind of a a a more mass version of what Germany does. Okay. It was obviously software and services, which which has you know borne tremendous fruit, and and agriculture being kind of the third leg, not not the reservoir of mass employment and and poverty, right? But rather you know a, a full uh, you know another another cylinder chugging along, right? That that tries to more you know that tries to emulate a Brazil or a Turkey in its global ambition. And I still think that that's fundamentally where where things are heading, and I think we see that in, in in terms of agricultural exports and the development of agriculture, even if there are still some you know huge structural issues in the agricultural economy. Yeah, let's just talk about the structural issues that you mentioned. Uh, the stru structural issues are land holding, labor reform, uh, availability of capital. Uh, is is that what it is, or is it just the sociology of way India is structured? Because of families and small holdings. No, no, no. I don't see, see. I, I, I think land reform is certainly part of it. Um, I think people overstate the the land reform issue to some extent. Um, clearly, we have, you know, clearly there needs to be larger average land holdings, but that doesn't mean that we need to bring back a generation of zamindars, right? Like, if if you, you know. And, and and what people fail to acknowledge, right, frequently fail to acknowledge, is that we have an example, right, on our northern border of a country that never had land reform. And it's not exactly like Pakistan is doing wonderfully from an agricultural perspective, right? They they still have estates of 10,000 hectares, 20,000 hectares, right? True zamandari system. Um, and, you know, I think in general, India beats them on yields, right? And what's funny is that China has even smaller land holdings than India and beats us on yields. So I, I don't necessarily think that, um, you know, that, that, that the answer to everything is to bring back massive estates, quite the opposite. I do think there needs to be some amount of consolidation, right? You need to have farmers with five hectares instead of, you know, two bigas. But like, you know, I, I think that... Um, that there's a lot of scope for, you know, with some modest amount of land reform, getting things to the point where um, you have e economically viable units of, of cultivation. I think it's important to understand the land reform issue, right? A lot of the land reform issue comes down to kind of two things. One is there is a very legitimate fear of losing one's land. Right, you know, you you do some sort of pagri arrangement with someone, and you let them, you know, cultivate it for you, and then they take it from you, and you never get it back again, right? And so, you know, and because they, you know, uh, they cut a deal with the patvari in a village and and screw you, right? And so, the, you really so so part of it is is building a layer of of you know, you could almost say a blockchain, a layer of digital ownership that makes a distinction between who owns the land, who cultivates the land, the terms of cultivation, direct subsidies in the right direction, because land, you know, because subsidies should go to the tiller, not necessarily the owner, right? So there's a whole information layer that could be built that doesn't require any consolidation at all, right? And But that would then facilitate, right, people, you know, people oftentimes keep one of their children on the land just to make sure it's not lost, make choices about to farm or not to farm based on that. So I think that's that's an important kind of point to understand. The second point is, is right, the point around land value and urbanization. 
right? Like, I, I, I don't think there's any person more miserable than a farmer from Gurgaon who sold their land in 1990, okay? Right, like, you know, or 1985 when the DLF was kind of coming together, right? And who sold for a fraction, a hundred, you know, it's, 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 like, it's like the difference between the people that, you know, bought Bitcoin in, in, you know, if you sold a Bitcoin in 2013 versus today, right? It's just, you know, the source of misery. Um, and, and so I, I think one thing to understand is that another reason why people don't consolidate land is this understanding that, you know, there is an implicit option value on land associated with urbanization. And so you better be damn sure when you're selling the family ancestral property that it's not the next good out. And, and so I, I think the, the, those two factors speak to the fact that we really need meaningful land reform, which is to say, you know, separating this issue of who cultivates from who owns and, and doing so in a way that allows for the, that allows for economically viable units to be put together while allowing people to retain the potential optionality on, in terms of real estate. Okay. Mark, Mark in, in uh, the 21st century, has any country massively faced with such, such great, yet great, great challenges, yet great opportunities? You know, India talks about, I've been writing for 20 years, and people talk about abolition of intermediaries, tenancy regulation, you know, ceiling on land holdings, you know, consolidate things, you know, uh, encourage cooperative joint farming, which actually they've been doing from 1947, perhaps. And, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, so, so, you know, when I look at agriculture in India, different regions have different problems. It's sometimes it looks chaotic. Sometimes it's beautiful. And, uh, and how do you, how, how, how can we look at it as a platform? You were just saying that if we look at it in a way, in a technical manner, if we can have great contracts, you know, then it works. But where do we begin? I know, I know a lot of your companies are doing that and we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, where do you get to this? No, a little bit about history. I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about the failed part in India and what can, what is really. I, I, let's, 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 let, let's start with the basics. Okay. Yes, please. One sixth of humanity feeds itself. Okay. Like that's before we talk about the failures, before we kick the green revolution's ass, yeah. before we, you know, talk about all the horrible things that the Bharat Sarkar has done to agriculture. Let's let's take a step back and, and congratulate ourselves a little bit, right? India went from a ship to mouth existence in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties, right, to within a decade becoming food secure, right? Absolutely. Even as the population exploded. Yes. And and so I I don't think we we realize what an incredible achievement that is. Right. We're in a moment right now where agricultural prices are, are you know, surging upwards because of the Ukraine war. And um, you have countries around the world. Right. Uh, Nigeria is a great example that are in, hugely dependent on food imports. And the reality for India is aside from till, aside from edible oil. Right. We barely import anything. OK. Now, our, our edible oil bill is very high. Right. But, you know. That's something that if there was ever the political will, we could actually bring down dramatically. But I, I, I don't think we, we congratulate ourselves enough on, on understanding just how an incredible achievement it was to get one sixth of humanity to become food secure. Um, so before we, we, we tear the whole thing apart, I think it's worth kind of saying, look, for the most part, this has been a tremendous success, right? For the most part, high yielding varieties, fertilizer subsidies, the FCI, the minimum support price, this whole system, even though it's a Rube Goldberg device, okay, um, has actually been pretty good about making sure that people have calories, right? Not necessarily nutrition so well, but calories that we have, you know, even though we have, you know, endemic levels of malnutrition in India, we don't have a lot of starvation. Right. And, and so I, I think like, let's start from there because I think too often times you have these like private sector participants that just rubbish anything Sarkari without kind of being like, well, you know, there's kind of a reason we went this way. Right. Um, and, and we apply kind of 2022 20, thinking to things without understanding like, like, Hey, you know, we cre originally created a PDS because like, <laughs> I don't know, it predates 
credit cards and digital identity, right? And like, there was no way otherwise to do it, right? You actually had to physically have ration shops, right? All of, you know, and it's equally true that in 2022, we don't need to keep doing things this way. And there are a lot of vested actors that want to preserve the status quo. But I think it's worth kind of starting from like, okay, we did a pretty good job, right? Even the public sector did a good job. The ICAR did a good job. Everyone did a pretty good job. I think that the challenges, like so many, you know, government programs, they outlast their usefulness, or at least they outlast the the boundary conditions and underlying assumptions under which they were created. You know, and that's when it gets tricky because you essentially, anytime you create a large government program, you you create you know a series of stakeholders that doesn't want it to change. And, and I think in general in India, that's kind of what we're stuck with from an ag reform perspective is these things that were very successful have massive bureaucracies. They're not required anymore, right? But, but everyone wants them to continue because, you know, I mean, everyone eats off of them, right? So like if we think about fertilizer subsidies, okay, fertilizer subsidies are not a bad thing. But there's not a single reason in the world you wouldn't want to do direct benefit transfer, right? Except the fact that, you know, everyone loots the fertilizer subsidy, right? Um, every, literally everyone in the system, right? There's, there's, you know, the same thing is true of the PDS. The same thing is true of the MSP and, 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 the, and the FCI's purchases of, of wheat and rice. And, and so, I don't know. I think a lot of, of ag reform is, in a sense, inevitable, Right, because I, I just think the tolerance for this kind of looting, right, this kind of you know misappropriation of assets, right, is just not what it used to be, right? Because everything is so much more transparent now, right? Um, and, and I think a lot of these, you know, you, you will naturally have pushback in the face of any, you know, in, in the face of any reform, right? Like you will just naturally have pushback. Um, so much of, of what happened in, in Delhi and, you know, with, with the, the farmer protests was, was about some very legitimate things. But some of it was just about the fact that, like, the Punjab government gets, like, 6,000 crore a year, right, in, in taxation from the Mundi system in Punjab that goes utterly unaccounted for, right, it, and goes straight to the straight. It's, so you can't take away right, that very strong political element and those decisions that have been made over time from like why people push back against things. And so I think ag reform will not be a straight line, right? It'll be a, it'll be like a tango or a waltz, couple steps forward, couple steps backward. But um, I think inevitably some of these, you know, essentially green revolution hangovers will be slowly but surely transformed. Mark, so uh, I was talking about a lecture that I, you know, heard, and uh, it was from Francis Fukuyama. who talked about the you know, rule of law and accountability if a democracy has to work. And he says in India's case, it has to start uh, with the bureaucracy, and there has to be, you know, a doubling of farm income and things like that. Uh, where are we in that journey today? Uh, while while in the city, we talk about technology playing a major role in price discovery. I still have cousins in uh, the village. Uh, I'm I'm uprooted from farming. I I don't know how to farm, but my father did, and he doesn't want to go back to it. He never wants to, right? So, but on the other side, I see uh, cousins struggling. This is in Andhra Pradesh and in Karnataka. Uh, they want their cousins to go into engineering. They want to sell off the land, and these are people who have five acre five acres or even sometimes ten acres, right? It's still a large large land holding kind of thing for an Indian for an Indian person or family. What's really happening? I mean, we know Punjab is going through, Punjab influences politics a lot in uh, every state. You know, farmers still have sway, but, but because of the political system, where do we change? Where, where does it change? What, what do you feel will change the needle in 10, 10 years? Not many people know this, but Mark made a very valid point. We have 70,000 crores of imports from vegetable oil. That's the only thing we import, right? Uh, everything else we export and we do very well. We are an export surplus nation in terms of agriculture. Yep. Uh, so, so Mark, what, knowing the sociology of the problem, what, what would change? And technology is just a tool. Uh, how will things change? Look, I, I think, 
I, I think change is coming in various directions. I, I don't think that, you know, I, I think there are many reformers in, in agriculture right now from the public sector, right? Uh, the Modi government uh, and various state governments have experimented with direct benefit transfer programs for, for inputs. Um, you know, there has been generally a push towards, right, really direct farmer subsidies uh, that started in, in Andhra and Orissa, right, and has now come into the, the center with the PM Kisan. I think there's a real recognition that you need to decouple welfare from price controls, right? If you understand historically in, in India, what we have done to, de to deliver farmer welfare, what I call the Rube Goldberg device, is to subsidize inputs and inflate outputs Right. And in the process, give that, you know, surplus to to farmers. Um, the problem is when you play with prices to do that, you wind up with this kind of Soviet style decision making. Right. In terms of like, oh, OK, so fertilizer is cheap. Let me use more of it than I need. Right. Or, oh, hey, I'm getting rice subsidized. So even though we export rice, don't need rice and it consumes our ground groundwater and results, you know, at least in. Punjab Haryana in, you know, these insane uh, field burnings, right, uh, in, th th that have to happen in order to get the wheat planted on time. Cool, let me make more rice, right? That's what happens when you use price to deliver farmer welfare. There's another way to do it. Cut him a goddamn check. Like, just, just decouple it. Right. You know, um, and that's what I, to, to the credit of the uh, uh, of the union government. Right. That is one of the things that they are doing. Right. They have created PM Kisan. PM Kisan is, you know, six thousand bucks a year. But PM Kisan could be sixty thousand bucks a year. Right. There's nothing that says that, that it needs to be six thousand bucks a year. Like we could make it 60. We could make it a lakh a year. Right. If we got rid of every other program. Right. And just handed that money to farmers and said, hey, here you go. Right. There's a lot of things that could happen. And I, I think the good news is. There is a willingness, there's a creativity on the part of, of the IAS, of various state government cadres, you know, to kind of move towards, I would say, meaningful reform of the areas where um, the public sector still dominates. I think on the flip side, um, the space that I play in, which is these agritechs, right, are really looking at, at trying to rebuild the rural economy. Um, in ways that are more supportive to farmers, in ways that cut out many of the intermediaries, that cut out the input intermediaries, that cut out the output intermediaries, that cut out the artias, right? And to some extent, that I think that will work for, for lots of farmers. You know, if you really think about your typical farmer, they are very much stuck in a poverty trap, right? Like a you know, Esther Duflo kind of like classic, you know, poverty trap, right? Where, um, you know, where effectively they are in debt to a money lender who also loans them less than great quality inputs and who also buys back their crop right so you're you're literally kind of stuck in this loop where you know no matter what you do right you never really get out of it and so i think what what various platforms like dehat have tried to do is to say hey you know let's stop this First of all, we will market your produce for you and we will get you a better price than selling to your local market yard, your local trader. You know, then, hey, we can probably supply you better inputs at better prices and not just whatever we make higher margins on. And finally, we can move you towards institutional finance where you can actually, as a farmer, benefit from low cost farmer finance. And so I think that's, that's just one example from our portfolio, but I think there are you know, many agri-tech disruptors out there that are kind of looking at this ecosystem and saying, you know, farmers get screwed, super normal profits are made by intermediaries, right? And, and we can be a much more efficient intermediary in the system and help farmers in the process and, and, you know, exist, right, in this space that's currently occupied by the intermediaries, but also by agribusinesses and build a large business in the play in, in, in that space, right? That both disrupts right all of the intermediaries, but also disrupts the large agribusiness companies. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of 
if you will, or at least competition and disruption coming on the private sector side as well. Okay. Uh, I, I want to go back to a little roots here. And I, and I think you've traveled m- much in India, more than me, perhaps. Uh, you know, if you go to this place called Kolar in Karnataka. Been there many times. A, yes, absolutely. And you know, for the last 40 years, for the life of me, I, every time I go back there, I see dump tomatoes right from the highway all the way till you cross Kolar and enter Mulbagal, or even cross, if you cross yeah. Mulbagal into, into Andhra, right? I've always wondered, and in 2006, I actually ran an article in, uh, in Business World at the time saying, can the retailers actually intervene and ensure price quality, buyback, and, you know, and, the, and nothing goes waste? And, and, you know, but I still see that being dumped even as close to as last year, you know? That was interesting. And tying that up with the government had offered into subvention schemes. I mean, there was a central government scheme. Then there was something on, on uh, what, what was that? Something, uh, there was something on payment uh, made on uh, negotiable warehouse receipts or something of that. Yeah, warehouse receipts is a big yeah. surprise. Yeah, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do tomatoes with warehouse receipts, they spoil. So. Absolutely. So, so, you know, picking up from this one small tomato kind of problem, uh, if you look at all the horticultural crops, how do we stand? So look, I mean, again, let's take a step back. Horticulture in India is another success story. It's yes, growing five, six percent a year. Agreed. Okay, Agreed. all of us eat more sabzi, have more fruits than we did ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago. The diversity is incredible, right? You know, even 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 in the posh sense, right? Like India now has like pretty good avocados, right? And and you being grown in Arunachal Pradesh and like there's all sorts of shit going on dragon right. fruit has become ubiquitous in, in Maharashtra Karnataka right you see it uh, everywhere and so um there's a lot of really good stuff that's that's happened there um I still think you know and and by the way Karnataka in general is probably one of the more progressive experimental states right they moved horticulture out of the Mundis a long time ago I still think inevitably you will have some regional gluts and you'll have pe- pe- you know, periods where the economics of, of tomatoes go, go topsy-turvy. Um, and that's why you see periodic like dumping and flooding. Um, but I think in general, right, the more that we can disintermediate between the farmer and the consumer, right, and that's increasingly something that's happening, especially in Karnataka. You speak to urban consumers in Bangalore, there's so many options where they can kind of farm source their produce or, right, various players that are that are kind of getting stuff to them faster, that I think some of this, some of this, uh, you know, tomatoes by the side of the road will, will reduce dramatically over time, right? Or at the very least, if there is waste, that waste will be value added or upcycled or, you know, you know, you'll start seeing more decentralized food processing. Right. So, you know, we, we, we turn that into tomato paste and, and you buy it. Right. So um, I, I think those those changes are coming. I think the reality of of agritech in India is that until about five years ago, it was still so small so peripheral, right? So niche and weird. There was just no money in it. And you guys and are I, considered to be playing in a in a field that they said people said this will never grow, right? People, people told me it was gone yeah. for a long time. Okay. It was I, I I remember one of the one of the senior most agribusiness professionals in India weighing in on a panel that basically everything I had done for five so um, it's it's nice to feel a little bit vindicated. It's nice to start seeing kind of this this future building itself. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I think we're at the beginning of a very long journey. Okay, I, I quickly want you to say in the podcast if you feel. I mean, we have seed subsidy, fertilizer subsidy, irrigation subsidy, power subsidy, export subsidy. Credit subsidies and much more. I think we have nine or ten different kinds of subsidies. Oh, there's more than that, but sure. More than that? Okay. Would you say that DBT is the best way? Let the farmers decide their future. I, I, think, I think DBT what? is the best. Is DBT is certainly the best way. And DBT that moves away from price subsidies. DBT, if you want to deliver farmer welfare, deliver farmer welfare. Right? If, if, if you ask me, like, okay, do you prefer you know, a DBT fertilizer subsidy or just flat out giving cash to farmers, 
like PM kiss on, I prefer flat out giving cash to farmers. I would rather give cash to farmers and then they can decide which type of fertilizer they want to use or move to a bio fertilizer or move to an organic fertilizer, right? Or move to permaculture or whatever. Like I, I want to, I want to stop using subsidies, right? To influence their behavior in ways where we don't really account for the externalities. I'd rather just cut them a check. And I would rather radically, like, I'm fine with it. Like, make it a, a lakh and a half, okay? Right? Put a floor on, on farmer incomes. Like, minute, you know, people talk about universal basic income. Universal basic farmer income, up fee, okay? Like, let's just do that. But in the process, right, let's move away from these incredibly awful environmental externalities that we create right? Because of what we subsidize, because we encourage the, the cultivation of rice, right? In, in a thousand kilometers around Delhi, right? Um, in, you know, that, that inevitably turns the entire thing into a gas chamber, right? Like, let's move away from overly subsidizing urea, right? In ways that accelerate India's greenhouse gas footprint and, and leach into groundwater. Like, let's, let's start, let, let's just give farmers cash, right? And let them decide what they want to do. I like that because they're all micro entrepreneurs and they can choose their own life. Yeah. And I would agree with that, right? But how can we keep, I mean, I, I mean, it, that's, a, that's a very puerile question, but will, will India ever get rid of the politics and, and the ideology of the day? I mean, in terms of getting farmers involved in, I mean, I keep telling a lot of my cousins that do your business. I mean, forget the political ideology of the day or, you know, just, but they say that it's linked and I, I, and I'm, you know, it's I don't necessarily think, I, I don't necessarily think that, that the rural vote bank swings in one direction or another at all. Right. I, I think quite the opposite. It's not all right wing. It's not all left wing. It's yeah. not all, you know, NDA. It's not all UPA. Absolutely. Right. I think it, it, it actually, it, it really varies. And you've seen rural votes, right. Topple governments in many cases in both directions. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the funny thing about, um, I, I'm actually kind of hopeful that, um, I, I didn't love the outcome of of what happened with with farm reform, right? Like uh, to be to be clear, I, I say this as as an immigrant to India, right? Not an, I, I've never you know I hate the term expat. Um, I am an immigrant, and um, and I, you know, ultimately it was the will of the voter, right? Like that that is a, that is a powerful thing, right? And and democracy must be respected. Um, because right, it's it's imperfect, but it's all we have. Um, but when I, you know, but when I think about kind of the way things played out, right? Did I, you know, did I love the fact that some pretty basic reforms were 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 rolled back because of rank politics? No, but you know, you got to make the political case for these things, and clearly that hadn't happened. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that um, in the next few years, the next time someone wants to pick up agricultural reform, they will, you know, hopefully this time talk to some farmers and put some sweeteners in it and, and make it part of a more meaningful package that, you know, acknowledges that the terms of trade have gone against agriculture for the better part of a century, right? And, you know, and that whatever we want to reform has to be from from a perspective of uh, you know of making rural India more viable. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. India is now talking about stacks. We talked about the fin finance stack, which is the UPI. We've done very well. Uh, we are now talking about a logistics stack. We're talking about a agri stack. stack. Agri stack as well. Absolutely. Oh, it's happening. Agri stack is happening. <laughs> I mean, that's that's already a thing. But I'm glad you said it has to be inclusive. You said talk to more farmers. Talk to more farmers, make it inclusive. Should we solve the logistics first or the agri side first or both together? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it has to be everyone. I think it has to be everyone. I, I, I think farmers have to do better. I think, you know, I, I think the whole ecosystem holistically has to be kind of moved forward. Yeah. Okay. Now getting to your company itself, 2010, Genation, you got together. I'm sure the word ag tech did not exist in India in 2010. Not, not yet. Not yet. It was coming. It was a few years after that. <laughs> right? 
you both got together and like you said, a professor said, this is not going to work. A lot of people say things don't work when you start up. Uh, for you, like you said, you uh, were you living in India full time at the time? At, at the time, yeah, yeah. And you were right. You were in Godridge, I knew. Uh, yeah, I was in Godridge. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we started this. You know, we we started this originally right out of Godridge. And and when you stand up, I mean, all the, I mean, not the naysayers. I don't want to say naysayers, but to make something work, like you said, it has to play out, right? It's patience, perseverance, twelve years. Uh, what moved the needle? As a VC for you and a person who understands agriculture and technology, is that was there a lot of lobbying involved, convincing, or was it the entrepreneurs who really did well and finally, you know, there was a path set forward saying that India is going to change in terms of using agri-tech for agriculture? What, what gave me the confidence to do this? Let me understand. Like, why, why did I ruin my life by doing this? <laughs> um, Look, I, I had sat in an Indian agribusiness company for a number of years and uh, a domestic Indian agribusiness company. And, and I saw that certain things were, were transforming, right, agriculture, but it was very slow, right? It was, um, it was very incremental. And at the same time, there was all of this stuff happening in, in the startup economy, in, in you know, beginning of the rise of Flipkart and, and all of these changes, digital changes that were coming. And that just wasn't filtering into large agribusinesses in India, neither the multinationals nor the large domestics. I just inevitably, you know, I think Janesh and I both saw this opportunity that there was going to be, you know, a storm right? That there was going to be this massive digital transformation and we wanted to get ahead of it. And, and so Omnivore was created with the support of Goldridge Agrivet to kind of catalyze an ecosystem when there wasn't one. And they were the first anchor VCs for you, right? Yeah. Mean, yeah. They were the first anchors of the fund, yes. And, that, and, and continue to be huge supporters. So. And, and is the professor who said this is not going to work uh, in touch with you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I you know, people don't, people don't usually correct themselves, but, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's been, it's been nice to see how things have played out. Yeah. Quickly, uh, you know, I have three questions, 33 startups and counting. Uh, when I look at the U S everybody talks robotics and agriculture now and AI and agriculture, India talks about platforms. Obviously it's more data now. Um, uh, well, Difference. Where are we going? Where is the, where is the U.S. heading in terms of Look, where are we heading? So, so the U.S. has a very different set of problems yeah, than India, yeah. right? So, so the U.S. Um, first of all, the thing to understand is that American farmers are are basically the most efficient farmers in the world, mm. right? So, and 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 your average American farmer is more or less a professional agronomist, okay? Um, and so, as a result, the you know the low hanging fruit in America is gone. Right, the, the the kind of yield boosts that that can happen only happen by by pushing the boundary, the the frontier of technology. You know, in India, a little bit of best, a little bit of better agronomy, and you can boost someone's yields, right, and their profits by twenty percent, twenty five percent. So we have a lot of stuff that needs to be more platform driven because we have a lot more inefficiency in our system and a lot more very basic upside without moving the technology frontier. Right. So that's one thing. Um, and so that, that's why you're going to see different ag tech, agri tech in, in India versus the US. The second thing is the major issue in the US is, is the lack of labor. Right. Labor is the is one of the biggest issues. Right. The US currently, right, is aging out of its farming workforce. Right. Um, so your average farmer in the US is in the 50s, 60s. OK. They have kept their children out of agriculture. And the U.S. is dependent on a very large amount of migrant labor from, yes. from Latin America that kind of keeps, you know, agriculture, especially in, in, in horticulture, going. Um, otherwise, you know, it's all through automation and mechanization and, you know, room. And, and so if you, if you think about, like, with those challenges in labor, right, what you need are autonomous tractors and robotic har harvesters and robotic pickers and, you know, which is, by the way, what's being innovated, right? Um, we certainly have some challenges in labor in India. It's not that we don't. Anyone who says that we don't, like, hasn't actually talked to a farmer, right? Farmers definitely struggle with, with no longer having 
the kind of inexpensive pools of surplus labor that they that they had for a long time. Um, but you know, I I think in general, what you're seeing in Indian agriculture is the building of an informational and organizational layer over the system. And on top of that, once that layer is built, you'll start seeing more deep tech that, that are more use case specific. We already back a, you know, an agri-tech startup called Tartan Sense that is, that is making the you know, inexpensive farm robots for Indian conditions. Um, you know, and, and I think for them to scale, right, they will eventually partner with you know, a number of, of agri-tech platforms in order to reach right, farmers, you know, en masse. Um, but you need that platform layer to get built, right, for, for deep tech to be viable uh, in an Indian context. Because again, unlike in America, where you can go to a farmer and sell them, I don't know, half a million dollars worth of goods, you can't do that with a smallholder farmer in India. And so in order to make things viable, you need these platforms to reach lots and lots of small farmers, right, and, you know, and, and bring that solution to them. Yeah, I know. I, last time they were testing it out in Chikmangalore, these, these guys, I, I, this was a couple of years ago. I wish I'm, I'm, I'm going to go talk to them again. Sure. And, and, you know, two more questions. Your guide to happiness. You said you ruined your life by doing this, but what is your guide to happiness in 30 seconds? And books that you'd recommend to our audience, books, pieces of heart that influenced you. It can be an agri book or an agri paper as well. I don't mind. Guide to happiness is not... I, I, I think, you know, I, I think the, the path to misery is constantly kind of uh, comparing yourself to everyone else, right? We're all on our own individual journeys, right? Um, the journey is long. And so I, I, I think, you know, I, 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 I'm a very big fan of, of the Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore, right? And, and in fact, have a large Tagore tattoo on my arm. Um, that says ek la cholore, okay, which is like walk alone, do your own thing, right? Ignore what everyone else says, follow your own heart. And, um, and so I'm a big fan of, of that kind of advice in life in general. With respect to favorite books, um, you know, I will always refer people back to the, the, the idea for Omnivore came from an old book called The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan, which was about food reform. It is very dated now, right? It is no longer au courant, right? It kind of reflects thinking in the mid 2000s, but I think it's still a useful overview of, of at least from a developed country perspective, um, what happened to agriculture and where it's going. I think another one um, that I would that I would recommend is uh, a friend of mine um, by the name of Sarah Mock. Um, Sarah is an ag journalist, um, you know, in in the U.S., um, but she is also um, she actually lived in Pune for a while while she was in school uh, doing uh, uh, like permaculture, and um, is just one of these uh, very interesting. Um, writers in the agriculture space. And she wrote a book called Farm and Other F-Words um, <laughs> that is, is a useful survey of, of something that people don't think about enough, which is that farmers are actually landowners. And, and the land ownership changes how they, how they behave and how they see their farming. I think it's a very useful book. Um, I will always um, refer people, like in, in terms of more recent histories, I'm a very big fan of uh, Ramchandra Guha and, um, and, and India after, after Gandhi, um, because I, I think it's one of these books that is tremendously useful to, to just understand what, what the leaders of the freedom movement, when they found themselves in government, got right. Right. It's very easy for people to like look back on the last seven or eight decades of, of the Indian Republic and just rubbish everything that that came before. And I mean, to be clear, it's a, it's it's kind of a trend in the last couple of years. And, and it's I always find it remarkable. Right. To imagine, you know, it's 1947. Right. You just spent the better part of a decade in jail and now you're in charge of a ministry. Right. You're a lawyer. Um, and, and just to like look at, at 
what what went right, right? You know, for all of the for all of the challenges, for all of the mistakes, um, you know, just just how remarkable uh, Indian democracy has been over over the decades, um, and and really what's been built, which everyone should be tremendously proud of. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mark Khan from Omnivore BC. Uh, I'm definitely going to go buy The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. And uh, your friend's book again, Sarah is the name. What's the name? Sarah Mock, Farm and Other F-Words. Farm and Other F-Words, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. But I'm going to catch up with you if you're in Thanks. Bangalore soon. There's so much cool. to talk. <laughs> Absolutely. Look forward to it. Bye-bye. Take care.